Hello, uh, my name is Romy, and I'm going to be talking about service design pioneering in the hardware industry. I work for a company called Beria, which is a uh, creative-minded, innovation-driven, tech-exploring, coffee-drinking, ocean-loving agency in uh, Gothenburg. And uh, for those who don't know Gothenburg, it's sort of the, the Rotterdam of Sweden. It's a harbor town, and it's a heavy industry kind of town. And uh, that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about friction, culture clashes, transition, and language, which are maybe not your average service design topics, but they are in this uh, story of exploring new territory with service design and pioneering. And in particular, the discomfort of pioneering. Uh, looking at this situation here, they don't know where they're going and what their first winter is going to look like. And uh, when you enter as a service designer in these hardware companies that are sort of unknown territory for service designers, it might feel a little bit like they are feeling uh, right there. Um, and to give this a little bit of context, um, we see very much that the lines between hardware, software, and services are blurring today. And um, the hardware industry is very much aware of that, but they have um, a hard time adjusting to that, I think, uh, because they're simply not as agile as digital native companies. Um, so today I'll be presenting four cases uh, of companies that I've worked for over the past years and my lessons learned of, uh, from being in this context. So my first ever design jobs was for Philips Design Probes, which was a small department within Philips who focused on far future uh, design research. And what they were doing was to inspire and create discussion around the needs of the world of tomorrow which was super, super visionary and super creative and super exciting. And what I like most by working here is that they, they didn't only invite designers and artists into the team, but also, for example, a biologist, which created very, very interesting uh, outputs from these projects. And my, my lesson learned here, I, I said before that they were very visionary, which was fantastic. But my lesson learned was an unanchored vision is no vision at all. And what this department sort of failed to do by being visionary is to not align it with the rest of the company. And Philips at the time was going from being sort of a market leader to being a market follower. And yeah, you can see the gap there. It didn't, didn't quite work out. So that was, that was not very beneficial, the outcome of that for, for this particular de department. Uh, my second case is uh, for er Ericsson Innova Squad which was a small team within Ericsson but that was focusing on implementing design thinking methods within the organization. And this was a very small team of one designer and two enthusiasts. And I joined the team as a, a master student writing the master thesis on, on how this implementation of design thinking was doing. And they, the way they were working is that they were gathering people throughout the organization that were mostly engineers into project teams in which they would like work with design thinking uh, methods and then would go back to their departments afterwards to, to hopefully spread this design thinking method. So my lesson learned here is to be a Trojan horse. So I learned quite quickly that when you come there to this organization full of engineers, that um, you come there with your design terminology and your tools and by sort of saying, hey, design thinking, this is what you should be doing, you might actually meet a lot of resistance. And by being a Trojan horse, I mean that you should maybe learn the professional culture and language of your audience and um, adjust the way you, you uh, present this method. And ideally, in the end, you might even make them think that it was their idea to start working with design thinking. So a Trojan horse. And that kind of leads up to, to the second tip here which is maybe more uh, specifically um, catered to junior designers. And that is to not be vain. Um, so when you come out of design tool, you're actually quite proud of all the design tools and skills that you learned, which is, is good. Um, but I actually would recommend to, to somewhat let go of your design tools and designer ways of working. So I have an example here of a customer journey map that I did in PowerPoint, which was not at all my tool, but it was the tool of my, my audience. And my goal with this was that I wanted to include the whole team in this, this customer journey mapping exercise. And that wouldn't have worked if I would have done the, power, uh, the customer journey map in Illustrator. Then my third case is Caterpillar Propulsion. And what they make is these 
really gigantic propellers for uh, big ships. And besides doing that, they also do uh, steering systems for tug and ferry boats. And uh, my role here is to do uh, an extensive user study on how these um, steering systems could be redesigned from sort of a user-friendly point of view. Um, so this is what my, my work environment looked like for a couple of weeks, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I was doing uh, interviews with the tugboat captains while they were in the harbor pulling in these big tanker boats. And um, my lesson learned from, from this um, case is uh, you can't fake curiosity. And that might sound a little bit harsh. Like What I mean with that is that if you are not curious to other people's competences, like you're maybe not interested in engineering or tugboating, you kind of have no business being there because it's not going to work out. Um, so when I, was, for example, started working at Philips or Ericsson or with Caterpillar, I didn't know anything about engineering or tugboating or programming. But um, I did start asking questions, and I showed curiosity, which sort of helps in, in creating a good dialogue and actually becoming an equal conversation partner. So second tip here, be one of the guys. Obviously, I'm not a guy, but I mean sort of with becoming part of the crew. Uh, and especially when you enter organizations alone as a service designer, you're very likely to want to gather people around you that are somewhat like-minded, that you sort of share something with. And that is, that's fine. You want your team. But um, I do want to remind people that they should not forget to stay close to people who are not immediately enthusiastic. And being one of the guys can also mean being one of the crew. So here on this particular tugboat situation, I'm taking a selfie being part of the crew. So I, I really uh, joined in on all the activities that they were doing there. Uh, and then the, the last case already, uh, Volvo construction equipment, which do that type of machines. And I joined the, the HMI department, which is a little bit of old school world of say, word of saying interaction design. And I worked mostly with uh, the development of new fleet management systems. Uh, so this is, is a little bit of context of like how Volvo looks like on the inside. And maybe to some of you, this might not look like the most exciting meeting ever. <laughs> but actually, this is a very, very meet a good meeting. Because a, a normal meeting would happen that everybody gathers around the table, opens up their laptop, and has a static discussion. Very uncocreative, so to say. So this is a very, very good meeting uh, where we're you know, standing up, doing post-its, co-creating, writing stuff, uh, creating together. So um, my lesson learned here is uh, understand hierarchies and make use of them. Um, so a lot of these older and bigger organizations are very hierarchical, and they're also very territorial. And um, if you don't learn sort of these, these hierarchies and rules from territory to agendas, uh, you might actually really step on people's toes and start making enemies. Uh, so my, my recommendation with that is that you should start making friends in different departments and find people who might have similar agendas to yours so you can actually achieve your, your goals. Uh, and then the second tip here is to stick around. As I said before, the hardware industry, they, they, um, they have much longer development times for their products. This could be five years. And then the life cycle of their, of their products could sometimes be as long as 20 years. So they cannot change as quickly as like a digital native kind of company. So um, by sticking around, I mean, like as you might be there as a consultant, like a couple of months won't really do. It's more like a couple of years that you need to invest there. Um, to summarize that then, um, be a Trojan horse. Be one of the guys. Embrace and use hierarchies. Don't be vain. You can't fake curiosity. Stick around, and an unanchored vision is no vision at all. Uh, so I would like to uh, leave this talk with some reflections uh, on service design. To me, the power of service design really lies in its many faces. And service design in the hardware context might not be sort of glamorous or flashy as it might be in other situations, but it's quite humble and hard work. Uh, and you should almost imagine yourself being a farmer planting uh, the seeds for, for great results, great services to appear later on. And when that moment finally comes, you should be aware to not be the star yourself, but the result is really the star. Thank you. <laughs>